We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Rafi Farber, author of The Endgame Investor and the Rafi Farber YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me today, Rafi. Good to be back, Tom. It's been a long time. It has, and it's it's great to speak with you again. And I thought we could kind of start, obviously, by you know touching on some of the current events. The debt ceiling debate is something that is, you know, obviously going to be resolved one way or the other this coming week. So I wanted to start by digging in with you on thinking about the consequences of, you know, if it is if it is passed, what the consequences of you know, $1 trillion worth of T-bills flooding into the market could be? Uh, that That's going to be uh, pretty consequential. Uh, I just wanted to preface this with um, with a little bit of a, of a story. I had a friend, I have a friend uh, from Florida who had a dog when I was a teenager named Fido. Uh, <laughs> so like I, I said to him like, you named your dog Fido. Like that's just like that's like the most stereotypical dog name ever. But he's like, he's like Rafi. Like, I named him Fido because everyone thinks that it's the most stereotypical dog name, but nobody actually names their dog Fido because of that. So I have the only Fido dog probably in the whole country. So uh, <laughs> that was, that about, was my about, immediate reaction as well. <laughs> yeah. So um so the point is that that this whole debt ceiling uh, issue. Nobody thinks it's going to trip the wire and cause the whole pyramid to fall. Uh, I don't think it will either, to be honest. It's going. I think it's going to be worked out, and I don't think it's that that the monetary pyramid of hell is going to fall because of uh, a lack of a deal on a debt ceiling. But then there's Fido. You know, <laughs> uh, it could just be this stupid of a thing that does it. And um, for what you but you, you have maybe like some powerful guy and. And the the rules committee or something decides to uh, filibuster it, or some some stupid thing could happen. I mean, there's always one or two Ron Pauls in the Congress that could trip something. Um, but yeah, so if it doesn't get passed, and then there's a default, uh, and credit ratings start uh, falling by the rating agencies, and then you have some kind of interest rate thing triggered and some kind of contract, and it creates some kind of cascade. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen if there is a default, but. Okay, but if it if if there is no deal for whatever reason, yeah, the bond markets are going to go crazy. Gold and silver are probably going to skyrocket, and things are going to change overnight. Assuming that uh, you know uh, Fido is Fido, that that a deal does get passed, then yeah, you have uh, a trillion dollars about of treasuries that should go should flood the market somewhere between the next month to three months. Uh, they're going to have to raise all this money in short term bills. And um, that is going, it's not that this money doesn't get created unless the Fed is ultimately buying these things. And they're not right now, right? If the if the Fed was printing money doing QT, then then it, it wouldn't be a problem for bank reserves. But the the Fed is still in a quantitative tightening. You know, they're still allowing their balance sheet to run off and, and uh, allowing the money supply to shrink. So if you have that, then where does the trillion dollars come from? It comes from the reserves that are already in the banking system. And it comes from deposits itself. And deposits, if you look at the big banks especially, are falling. Uh, uh, I think uh, in April was the latest data. And they're falling at the fifth fastest rate ever, uh, <laughs> which is uh, pretty fast. I think it was only uh, before the last two months, before before the um, the March banking crisis really kicked in, the worst month besides this past month for the big bank deposits draining was September 11th, 2001. Uh, the, September 2001, that was the worst month. So uh, these these uh, the treasury bills are going to have to, the money is going to have to transfer to the treasury's account at the Fed from deposits of banks that have extra reserves. And the small banks don't have extra reserves. The big banks do. The big banks are the ones that buy these things on, on the on market, on auction. So what we're probably going to see is deposits uh, already falling at the big banks are going to fall even faster, and then add that in with uh, with tax day uh, for corporations and other uh, other entities on June fifteenth. Then you have all that money that's is in their deposit account. It's going to go to the government also. 
uh, add that in with QT and you could have some trouble in the plumbing system. And uh, we don't, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. Maybe reverse repos will come to the rescue. Maybe they won't. Nobody has a, a straight answer to this. So uh, it's going to be, it's going to be volatile that we know what exactly happens. We don't know. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, in essence, we're draining more liquidity from the system alongside, you know, these, these other factors, as you said, like, like tax day. So does that combination really create the issue here? Um, it did create the issue during the apocalypse of 2019. That's what happened. And um, still, you could study that. Uh, and there's going to be a thousand reasons why that specifically happened on that day. It's just a reminder, the the apocalypse was uh, there. The repo market is basically um, uh, overnight treasury backed uh, loans. So banks can be within the regulatory uh, windows for the night uh, of, of reserves. And what happened on that day, uh, on September 17th, I think it was that uh, the upper limit on the overnight loans for that market went to about 10%. And nobody really knew why. And then there was like this this theory kind of got coalesced by different sources that uh, the Fed was was tightening its balance sheet, which it was at the time. And you had tax day on September 15th for corporations. And and uh, you had at the same time a whole flood of treasuries. I think it was like 70 billion or some tiny number by today's standards, right? Uh, all flooding the market at the same time. And for for whatever reason, there there wasn't enough uh, overnight liquidity to satisfy the repo markets, and then it blew up ten percent. And then the Fed had to immediately reverse uh, quantitative tightening and start expanding its balance sheet again. Uh, and that's what happened. And then uh, you know a few months later, we had the lockdowns and all that other lovely stuff uh, and uh, huge money printing. And uh, so we have the same we have the same factors now. Tax day quantitative QT, quantitative tightening, and a flood of treasuries. Uh, and it's a lot worse now than it was then. Uh, the only difference is now we have um, we have like about $2.2 .2 trillion in reverse repos that we don't know what, what they're going to do, what role that they have in this, because a lot of that is locked up. A lot of that extra cash is locked up in money market funds and stuff that might not be redeemable so fast. So we don't know if that money can move to save the repo market. Maybe it can, maybe it can't. What happens if there's like a repo crisis and there's $2.2 trillion stuck in reverse repos? Does this Can this money move? I guess we'll find out. I, I don't know. But the point is, um, don't try to predict this, exactly what's going to happen and be like a, you know, a micromanager or microsurgeon of monetary markets. Just be humble, say you don't know, and make sure you got what you need. <laughs> That's my approach. So Rafi, you know, is part of the the reason maybe that you don't expect this to be the the fireworks that some people are predicting is that there have been a lot more of the repo facilities set up since 2019 to be able to deal with a problem like this or or do you think that that could be outweighed by the amount of treasuries like you said that that relative level in 2019 is a lot bigger now um well, let's put it this way. Uh, I, I'm not predicting if it's going to have big effects or not. Um, I, there's something big is going to happen. We just don't know wh what the downstream effects of that is going to be. Um, I mean, like a, tr a trillion dollars in treasuries over two or three months. Like what, if that's got to come from, so we already know that the small banks are in dire straits. I mean, the, they've uh, they've stopped bleeding, but you know, one more banking failure could lead to another cascade of deposits that flee the system. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they they set up these standing re standing repos and all these facilities to handle all this liquidity. But when you set something up, it's like when you when you're building a pyramid on top of a pyramid on top of a pyramid and all these like drainage systems to like deal with it. Like you're you're taking resources from something and moving it to something else. And nothing is stable. So. Every complexity you add to the system causes the instability somewhere else. And you know, ask Zoltan Pozar what he thinks is going to happen. No, he doesn't even know. It's like this: this whole thing is a monster, and no one is in control of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's only a matter of time before it explodes. And when it does, we'll all go back in time and say, "Oh, it was this and that." And uh, when when this thing happened and that fell over, then it was this. And, 
And then people are going to write papers about it and then they're going to fix that problem. And there's going to be another one that they didn't think of. I mean, the, whole, the thing is that this whole thing is inherently unstable and um, predicting exactly where it's going to fall is uh is a fun academic exercise and might get you a doctorate. Um, but uh, it's not going to make you rich because no one's going to get it right until it happens. Yeah, that's a great point. Rafi, you know, again, we're not trying to predict what's going to happen, but could this mm -hmm. force the Fed into a spot where they need to stop running the balance sheet off? Oh, yeah. Well, look, if you take it in, in broad strokes like that, yeah, liquidity is being drained off. Interest rates are moving to uh, five and a quarter percent, five and a half percent. Consumer price inflation looks like it is bottom, then it's going up again, especially we see this in the UK. Um, liquidity is being, being drained off. So that can't be sustained while while keeping the current size of the pyramid intact. It's just it's not possible because the more money you print, the more financial entities exist that need more printed money to survive, and they become an integral part of the pyramid. So yes, eventually this whole thing is going to implode, and the Fed's going to have to reverse, um, just like they did in 2019, but in a much more extreme way because there is uh, there is a um, a an exponential curve here on the Fed's balance sheet that they have to meet that line uh, because money printing is an exponential exercise. It, it can't be anything but. Um, and every time that the Fed balance sheet assets get off of that exponential curve, there's some kind of financial crisis and they got to get right back on it. Yeah. So um, they're, they're, they're testing the curve now. They're going to get back on it. And where they have to get back on it is much higher than it is now because we're approaching the vertical line of this, uh, this exponential curve. Mm -hmm. So Rafi, there was, there was another piece in there that, you know, I think has really thrown a wrench into a lot of things. And as you say, I think, I think it could add to the complexity of, or it is adding to the complexity of this issue. And that's the banking crisis. You know, you, you, you mentioned that this was the fifth largest monthly loss for the big banks in deposits ever. So where do you think that these deposits are going? Is it still you know, just just people moving their money to, let's say, money market funds or other types of accounts that pay higher interest. Is it still fear from banks being insolvent? You know, where do you think that capital is moving and, and why? Um, well, it would have to be moving out of the banking system because if it were moving to some other bank or if it was a small bank moving to a big bank, a small bank deposit, somebody with a bank account in a regional bank somewhere moving into like, say, Bank of America or JP Morgan, there wouldn't be any net change in deposits. It would just be the same because they're all part of the same M2. So if you see deposits going down, um, they're either moving entirely out of the monetary system, which would be reverse repos, um, or what's happening is debt defaults um, that that erases money. Because when, when let's say a, a bank gives me a loan um, or gives anyone a loan, that loan is counted as part of the money supply because it, it, it gets paid back over time. And that, that asset, that loan is considered part of the money supply and it's counted as the amount of dollars that are eventually owned, that are eventually owed by that, that payer. Um, but if, if that debt is defaulted on, then that asset goes away from the banking system and it's, it no longer exists. So I think it's a combination of deposits going into money market, uh, going into money market funds, which are fed by reverse repos. And, uh, I think it's also, uh, like small scale debt defaults that are happening, um, whether they're mortgages or credit card debt or some kind of debt that is uh, going out of existence and contracting the money supply that way. I think that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Is the IMF worried about this banking crisis becoming worse at this time as well? Yeah, it seems that way. Um, I I looked at, um, I think I saw this on Zero Hedge, and then I looked at the original source. Um, the, the IMF comes out with a, a statement called Article 4 something uh, for each country on how their economy is doing and what the, the IMF's recommendations and their concluding remarks and stuff. So they came out with uh, their 2023 statement for the United States. Uh, they they started with this ridiculous uh, praise of um, like poverty levels for minorities have fallen since 2021. And then in parentheses, this is because of the pandemic era transfer payments, uh, which seem to be abating now. Well, yeah, when you when you print money and you put it in people's bank accounts to buy stuff, it seems that they get less poor. So <laughs> it's not really... There's not much chachman to that. It's not really a wise thing, obviously. And then for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the statement, they were talking about um, 
banks and how there are troubles and um and in so many words the IMF is pretty nervous um they spent paragraphs talking about about this this problem and and, and then I looked at at the 2007 2008 and 2009 statements uh the sa- the same article for conclusions and um that's when they should have been the most negative and they said they they said something in those years about in 2007, 2008, especially like, oh, there's something wrong with the housing market, but we think it'll be fine. And the United States has been doing a great job and it's amazing. And, you know, they got to get entitlement spending down a little bit, but everything's fine. Uh, so usually they're cheerleaders. And this time they cheer led with, you know, transfer payments of trillions of dollars, <laughs> uh, you know, helping the poverty line. And then uh, we're worried about banks. So, uh, yeah, th- whoever wrote that is worried about banks. And the IMF, they're supposed to be, uh, cheerleaders and a uh, and a, what do you call it? A, a fo- not a focus group, but uh, what do you, what's what's the other word for cheerleaders? A public relations firm. They're supposed to be a public relations firm for the central banks of central banks, and they're not doing a good job, or they're really scared. That's my conclusion. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you mentioned that they were worried about the housing market in two thousand eight, and obviously there there are a lot of differences from that time to now. The way that loans are structured. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you pointed out recently as well that that housing prices have have really started to fall in the U.S. So does that, you know, maybe point to being a leading indicator of the true shape of the American economy at this time? It's interesting that um, about housing, here's the main difference as I see it from 2008. Um, in 2008, the Fed owned zero mortgage-backed securities. Nobody knew even what a mortgage-backed security was. It was like George W. Bush had to like get on the news and say, well, here's a lesson in mortgage-backed securities. And everyone was like, what, what's that? What are you talking about? And then everyone figured out that, found out that, oh, like the banks, they don't hold on to your mortgages. They just like shuttle them off to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and they just hold all this stuff. And then they collapse, and like I didn't know how. Nobody knew that's how the housing market worked, except for some, you know, people high up in Wall Street that knew about this stuff. Now everybody knows what a mortgage-backed security is, and who owns them now? Who owns them? Not Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Who owns them now is the Federal Reserve. They they own them. So the if if something is on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, then that is the other side of the dollar, because one side of the Fed's balance sheet are the dollars that exist. And the other side of the dollar is everything else that's on the balance sheet. So meaning housing, which is the mortgage-backed securities, and um, and the dollar are now two sides of the same coin. So if housing goes up, the dollar's purchasing power goes up, uh, you know, as, as a, on a market cap, you know, not an individual dollar. I'm not talking about an individual dollar, but all, all, all dollars can theoretically purchase more than, you know, than otherwise. Uh, but now that that housing is is really connected or welded to the dollar, when housing prices really start to fall and and people start defaulting on these mortgage backed securities, uh, it's the dollar itself that's going to suffer, and that's hard to really conceptualize because you'll see you know, you'll you'll hear about falling housing prices and rising consumer prices at the same time. It doesn't seem to make sense, but that is what is going to happen uh, because because. The other side of the dollar, so much of it is mortgage-backed securities. I mean, I think like 40, 50% of it or something like that. Um, the the rest is treasuries and some gold, uh, the the gold in Fort Knox. So um uh if we uh, so what could really hurt the dollar and destroy its purchasing power is either um a default on mortgage-backed securities, a default on treasuries, um, or both, uh, because that's really what the dollar is by definition now. Because they're counting those mortgage-backed securities as an asset that is going to be paid back, right? Yes. Yeah. So, Rafi, where do you see inflation heading from here? You know, you recently wrote about the paradox of monetary and non-monetary forces on prices. So how do these lags and cycles interact and play out over time? Right. So monetary forces on prices um, is just looking at the monetary side of a transaction. Right? There's two sides to every transaction. There's money and there's what you're exchanging for the money. So a, a monetary a monetary effect on, on prices would be the money supply expands and therefore um, prices go up, right? That's, that's simple uh, supply and demand. But on the other side, 
you have the non, the, the, the non monetary forces when the when the money supply goes up that if the, the effect is lowered interest rates and lower interest rates allow more investment in capital projects and the more capital you have invested in in uh, extracting commodities or whatever it is you're going to have a higher supply of those commodities and that is a non monetary force from the supply of the non monetary thing in the in the transaction that's going to the price is going to fall so uh, over the long term right lower uh, over the over the the longer term, lower interest rates are paradoxically they're going to lower prices for commodities because they're going to expand capital investment in the projects to extract more of them. But eventually, the the higher money supply over the like, you know the longer longer term, like you know you could say 10, 15 years, twenty years, whatever. I don't I don't know exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, over that term, uh, the the money supply is going to catch up and cancel out any productivity gains in uh in the supply of uh whatever commodity you're digging up from the ground right so you have this war between the monetary and the non-monetary forces and the question is basically when do the monetary forces eventually wipe out all of the supply gains and i think the answer is when the when the money supply has to go has to expand at a faster and faster pace much faster than you could ever extract resources from the earth or build stuff with capital uh, at, at a certain point the amount of money has to keep climbing climbing faster and faster and faster in an exponential curve if i was just looking at this this morning i was looking at turkey um and and looking at their money supply and their their exchange rate with the with the the lira's exchange rate with the dollar keeps getting worse and worse and worse and a faster and faster rate and then you look at their money supply and it keeps expanding faster and faster you look like turkey why don't you just stop printing money for a second all right and let your currency just like regroup and stop attacking it the answer is they can't Mm -hmm. because that would lead to that would lead to the collapse of their banking system which is all dependent on more and more and more lira coming into the system but it's the same with every fiat currency so the the monetary forces are going to trump the non-monetary forces pretty soon. And this is just another way to describe the end game or the hyperinflationary end game or whatever you want to call it. It's all the same way, different ways to describe the same elephant. Mm-hmm. Can can we use the the British pound as another example of these of these currencies starting to weaken drastically, you know, over time? Let's say the the midpoint in this process. Um, I think the the British pound is a little bit of a special case. Uh, I think for two reasons. One is that they were they were uh, I think the only one. I think the only Western country or the only developed country that uh, during the the lo- the initial phase of the lockdowns they decided to allow their central bank to directly finance the government deficit. Immediately when this happened, I think in March or April 2020, I said uh, it looks like uh, the UK is going to be the first to uh, hyperinflation. I didn't know when. Um, but when you start doing that, um, it's bad, it's bad, bad news. And um, uh, I, I know that not from personal experience, but um, but I, I looked into the hyperinflation in, in Israel in 1984, and that's exactly what happened. And um, the, there was this like comic strip called um, Dry Bones. It's like uh, some Jewish guy or Israeli guy uh, was. It's like it's like the it's like the Israeli peanuts or something like that. And and he was writing about the hyperinflation of the old shekel uh, in around 1984, 1985. And then the punchline of the comic strip was like, and then we fixed the problem, but nobody knows how we did it. Uh, and that's the for some reason, the new shekel just like survived and nobody knows why. But I, I looked into why the, the answer why is because they changed the rules of the central bank. And they said the, the Bank of Israel can no longer directly finance uh, the deficits of the of, of the Knesset, of the government. That's now illegal. And that was enough confidence instilling to say, okay, fine, we'll give you another shot on this new shekel. Just index it to the dollar, and we'll give you a new IPO on the on the currency. So, um, uh, along with directly financing the debt, uh, directly financing the 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 bailouts and the co- the 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 lockdown financing and all this, um, the the UK also decided to hand out hand everyone hand out everyone the, like seventy percent of their paycheck. And the UK still has this like hangover vision of itself as the financial hub of the world, which they've hold, held over from the 19th century. So they think they can do more with the pound than other countries. They can they think they can abuse it more than other countries can. Um, so they just went totally hog wild. Um, and now they're suffering. And uh their their government makes less and less sense by the day. And um and uh yeah, uh I think food inflation, food price inflation in the UK is something like twenty percent, 
and uh the and the guilt uh the um, the 10-year guilt the 10-year bond is at the crisis levels is what it was when you had all these pension funds in near uh, within hours of totally being wiped out uh because of the LDI what was it the what do you call it? liability driven investments that they were they were doing for retirement accounts basically to like rev up the yield and get more yield out of it uh so we're at those same crisis levels except who owns the bonds now not the retirement funds the bank of england so it's the, it's the same thing with with uh with with housing in america being housing in the us being tied to the dollar uh now the um the 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 gilts are tied to the pound so the higher interest rates go in the uk the worse it is for the pound um and i don't think there's a way out of this for the uk i think this is uh i think we're in the hyperinflationary spiral I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. It's just my feeling. I'm not placing any bets on it, but uh, that's what I see. So where do you think we should draw the line between high inflation and and hyperinflation here, Rafi? Like, you know, we can look at Argentina, for example, that recently moved its headline interest rate to 97% versus, I think I, I was reading that the, you know, the, the headline rate for the, the pound is 7%. So you know where is the difference there and is it is it more you know really a gradation of the process that you're talking um it's an it's an inevitable process and it is going to happen because there's no other direction that the system can go in i mean theoretically you could just deflate the entire thing and go back to $35 an ounce of gold from 1933 but then <laughs> That, that requires an entire restructuring of the entire economy for the last like 90 years mm-hmm. right it was hard enough moving moving gold from 21 to 35 and that 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 led to a it didn't lead to it was part of a great depression um of uh it was basically an admission that the entire price array the entire price system that we have is wrong now we have to reevaluate all the prices of everything and that was the that was the repegging of gold from 21 to 35 and that created huge disruptions in the economy and people that were part of that economy are part of that price array system and no longer were they making money they lost their jobs okay so that <laughs> that's what would happen um so yeah i think i don't there i don't think there is a qualitative difference between you know jogging inflation or even low inflation and hyperinflation i think it's just a different part of a curve um, and once you get to like 97% interest rates, um, it, it's not the interest rate that really matters anymore because that's only the front end. That's only what you can see. What you can't see is on the back end of a central bank, right? What does the question is, what does the, what does the bank of Argentina actually own? It owns its own bonds, right? And some other bonds, but, but so the higher that they put the interest rate on these bonds that they own, the worse the, it's going to be for the currency that's on the other side of it. So that's what happens with all these incestuous relationships of the of the central bank with their currency. If they buy debt denominated in their own currency to back their currency, that is a system that will automatically implode at some point. It just depends on what part of the curve you're in, you're on. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, I think I think at the beginning there, it's it's we have to conceptualize gold as the 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 true measuring stick of the of all of these currencies, right? You you recently had a little bit of a back and forth with Keith Weiner talking about the idea that it's not necessarily that gold went up, but maybe that the dollar went down, right? So thinking about some of these currencies relative to their their respective measuring sticks is a much probably a much better way to to understand these processes and and where they might be at is that is that fair to say Rafi? Yes, yes, it's it's really it's the only way to understand it. I mean, uh, I'm I'm on the same page with Keith Weiner on this and um it's not a very popular position uh but I, I was having another conversation with uh with a, a Wall Street guy um named David Wu on my channel and he's a pure-blooded central banker. Um, it was very, it was, uh, it was interesting talking to him because I, I knew we weren't going to agree on much. But the first he, thing I pointed out to him, he, he was what? an IMF banker. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I said well, Wall Street IMF. Yeah, he worked in both places. Mm-hmm. Nice guy, but like uh, we didn't really see eye to eye on anything. And the first thing I pointed out to him was like, um, you know, so you worked on Wall Street, you made all this money, great, that's wonderful. 
Um, but if you look at you know the S and P 500 versus gold since 1971, uh, gold's outperforming. So you could have just done nothing and made more money. Uh, so and then he answers like, well, so what? I mean, gold is just a commodity. Well, like you're just arbitrarily like pinning stocks versus gold. Why not stocks versus I don't know palladium or rhodium or whatever? And I was like, but he doesn't understand because because gold is money. Because it still is. This is not. It's not just like. It's not just uh, you know a religious statement that or you know like a mantra that we say. It's the truth. Um, you know when again when Roosevelt moved gold from twenty one to thirty five, like if if you don't see that gold is money, then what the hell is the point of that to make like wedding rings more expensive? Like what's that going to do for anything? You know it's 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 not it uh, when gold is like twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars an ounce. We're not talking about a world where everything is basically normal, except it costs a little bit more to buy a wedding ring. Okay, <laughs> it's it's something a lot different from that. It's uh, it's it's a world where the money is falling apart. So because again, I go through I go to this all the time because of the monetary regression principle. You can't just create an, an array of prices out of nothing. It is impossible. Everything always has to be indexed to the past. And what is the past? Ultimately, the dollar was it originated as a gold substitute, which means it still must be one. Because if it isn't one, then the entire chain from the past to the present falls apart and you have no prices of anything. So yeah, all these all these these currencies moving up and down and stuff, it's real, it's it's uh it, sorry, when gold moving up and down is really currencies uh in their latter stages of life uh moving up and down because of uh you know the nature of fiat system uh which is now uh, in in the hyperinflationary stages as uh, you know Daniel Oliver points out you don't have hyperinflation without hyperdeflationary scares which is what forces the central bank to issue more and more currency every time because if they don't there's a hyperdeflationary crash and that's what forces the the curve vertical that's that's where we are yeah it seems like this this i want to say game of cat and mouse but it's it's this game of problem reaction solution and it ends up as you say that exponential curve means that they have to keep reacting in a more dramatic fashion to be able to try to to achieve the effect that they're going for right right they, look in other words there's a predetermined course here um and you can trace it back to the origin Right when when the when the Fed when the Fed uh, when they very the very first time they decided to uh, inject liquidity into the market by buying a bond, right? Then eventually that bond is going to be repaid on the Fed's balance sheet, and that money is going to come out of the economy back to the central bank to pay that bond, and then you'll be back to the original money supply. But you can't be back to the original money sub supply because now there's more people that are dependent on that new liquidity that you just printed. So the answer is you have to print more liquidity to pay back that original liquidity. And then you have all this more new liquidity that you have to issue more liquidity to pay back the, the, more, the, the, the higher amount of liquidity that you printed. And it just keeps going, going, going until the whole system explodes, implodes, whatever. I mean, but it's a predetermined path. Mm -hmm. It is guaranteed. The only question is where... What is the exact angle of our curve? Are we vertical? Are we like, you know, 89 degrees? Are we like, eh, where, where exactly are we? I can't say with certainty, but we are going in the same direction and it is faster and faster and that cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. Rafi, you know, one of the um, the points that you mentioned to me that I think is worth touching on here before we hit record this morning, you you were telling me that you have a bit of a different view on the process of the, of the BRICS nations, let's say, trying to you know have their own currency to trade amongst each other with and that taking away from the US dollar which ultimately you know leads to the demise some argue quicker than others of the US dollar so what is your view on on the notion that this is means you know death for the US dollar right away mm -hmm. uh, well look by definition um, all other currencies be cut. Be, well, okay, so let's go. I mean, going back to 1946, 1971, you had a system called Bretton Woods where um, other countries uh, were encouraged to hold US dollars instead of their own currencies. And then if they wanted gold, they could redeem it at the central, at the Federal Reserve for 35 ounces of gold. 
right? So that created a skeletal structure where all these foreign countries had a whole stack of dollars in their central banks that backed their currencies, which were derivatives of the dollar. And if they wanted gold, they could redeem dollars. So then uh, in 1971, Nixon said, you know what? Uh, we're going to uh, hollow out the system so that there's nothing inside it. There's no gold anymore. Um, and But the scaffolding, the pyramid, will keep, will keep that. So uh, what you had was instead of gold being the core of it, you had the dollar being the core of it, and then all other currencies being derivatives of the dollar. So every country that wants to um, be part of this global system now since 1971 has to have a reserve of U.S. dollars on which they base their currency. And then you have the whole derivative system, which is based on the U.S. dollar, which is still ultimately based on gold, but nobody wants to admit that. Right? <laughs> um, so what I'm saying is that every other currency of every other country that participates in global trade is a dollar derivative. So if they're saying, oh, we want to settle our trade in um, in Brazilian real or Chinese yuan instead of dollars, fine, you can do that, but you're still going to denominate your trades in terms of US dollars and then ultimately settle it in yuan. What are you going to do with those yuan? If you want to get back into another trade, you're going to have to use dollars anyway. Um, the only the only way to get beyond the the skeletal remains of the Bretton Woods system is to dig underneath its foundations and trade in gold. But no country wants to do that because it's honest, right? You can't get any kind of advantage from trading in gold. I mean, governments can't. People definitely can because people benefit from honest trade. Governments don't because they benefit from stealing. Uh, so, so uh, no country wants to do that. Uh, no country wants to trade in gold. The minute they do, I'll say, fine, the dollar is being uh, upended. Now, does, the, does this mean that, that the dollar has a lot of time left? No, it doesn't. Because um, it, what, what I'm saying is that, that the dollar is going to collapse. It's going to collapse quickly. But it, it's not going to collapse because of what any country says it wants to settle their trade in. Because it's ultimately always going to settle it in dollars. Because every other currency is a dollar derivative, by definition. It, the dollar is going to die in the streets of the U.S., and then from then, at that point when it does, uh, foreign countries that have used the dollar are not going to be able to use the dollar anymore because it's already dead. So they're going to have to move to gold. There's no other way. So, of course, Rafi, we're, we're speaking on May the 30th, and that means it's uh, delivery month for gold and palladium. So how has this theme progressed? And have you seen any, let's say, signals from delivery months related to price moves you know, at these types of inventory levels that we're seeing? Actually, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't seen. I haven't seen any correlation between um, gold deliveries, gold deliveries, and gold prices, um, or really silver deliveries and silver prices. There's been a little bit in silver. Um, uh, every time that uh, the the supply of registered silver is around where it is now, there is some kind of inflection point in the price, whether it be a low or a high. But it's not really that hard of a of a correlation. But what I would say. Is that um, that the the supplies of metal in the COMEX uh, falling is still very significant because at some point people are going to go after the physical supply and that hasn't happened yet. Um, actually, in 2020 it was reverse. It was uh, supplies flowing into the COMEX and not out. Uh, exactly what triggered that? It, it's like you know a repocalypse sort of mystery. I'm sure somebody deep in the plumbing understands it, but um, very few people do. Uh, but um, with uh, with with gold, uh, we've seen the supply of, of gold in the COMEX physically moved down significantly since uh, since March, April, May 2020, when it hit all time highs. It's still pretty high. Uh, silver is actually getting very dangerously low uh, to historic lows, not gold and um, palladium. Uh, I think there's like 600 contracts that are open that are to be delivered uh, open that have to either be closed or delivered tonight. And there's like 400 uh, left. Uh, I don't expect there to be much of a problem there, but look at some point, at some point there's going to be a rush for physical and people are going to raid the COMEX all at once. Um, and uh, the, the, the current drain of metal since, uh, since 2020 could be reflective of that might not be. Um, so I, I keep, I keep an eye on the COMEX in the back of my head just to see what's going on there, but I don't use it as a signal to, uh, see what the, what's the spot price going to be a week or two, three, a month from now. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I, I think that's a, a really important point that, you know, we've, we've gone through COMEX issues back and forth here on the show so many times and, you know, it doesn't really seem like there is a 
there's a great correlation to be able to read the tea leaves of that for any particular outcome. Um, Rafi, you're, you're also paying attention to the gold and silver ratio. Where are we at with that? And is it, you know, close to some very important technical levels? Um, I do keep a half an eye on this also. And I did notice uh, that it was, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere in the, in the, the 70s, is it? 75, 73. It was, it was somewhere near the 200 week moving average. And I, I, I zoomed out on the chart and I noticed that most of the time since 1990, uh, the the gold to silver ratio has been higher uh, than, let's say, wherever it is. What was it, 75? I might be wrong in the number, 80 something. Um, but wherever it is now, it's been it's been higher than the the 200 week moving average for like 95 percent of the time. Um, and then at certain panic points, it like kind of dives below it for b- very briefly when silver is like really climbing, like it did in 2011 or in 2020 relative to uh, relative to golden stocks. Um, so we're right at the line now. And uh, we've been below it for a few months. If we can stay below this uh, gold to silver ratio, um, below the 200 week moving average, um, we should start to see silver move seriously. And it seems that gold is um, is at the end of uh, a little bit of a correction here. And uh, either there's going to be a debt ceiling deal or there's not, and that could be a trigger for something to move. If there's not going to be a deal, yeah, I think gold's going to explode and so is silver. And if there is a deal, then the flood of treasuries could cause it also. Um, but, uh, look in the, in, in the end game, we're looking, and I say this to my subscribers, we're looking for, uh, something between a 25 and a 15 to one ratio gold to silver in a true monetary panic, because the role of silver is as the ultimate gold substitute, right? When no gold substitute is trusted anymore and they don't work, there's no other way to buy things on a retail level. That's the only thing you can do. Yeah. It's interesting to, as you say, like, put these numbers into into context for for where we have been before and as you said you know we're not necessarily trying to predict anything important but i think it's i think it's great to be able to look at these technical indicators along with some of these fundamental stories as possible you know inflection points for when you know something big and undisclosed might happen to force a real reversal in those technical patterns mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, and I just want to point it out, point this out. Like we're we're in a world now that has really never existed before in terms of communication, and you know, people like you and me talking about these things. The the fact that that there's so much attention on on this stuff means that there's a lot of people that understand that this is what money is, that it's important to follow it, that it's not just we're not just like tracking the price of wedding rings, you know, <laughs> uh, or something like that. We're tra- we're tracking the 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 temperature gauge of the of the monetary system and the fact that that you know you get so much traffic and 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 I'm getting all these followers and people that are interested in what I'm saying and what you're saying and there's so many other channels like yours that are that are so that are also really good it means that people are paying attention mm-hmm. right and we know something is up and when it happens that means that we're not going to be surprised by it we'll be surprised by the exact cause of it but we'll say yeah okay we knew it was coming and um and you know everyone's complaining and i'm complaining why is why, why is it taking so long and what and and it's it's frustrating but but we all know we all know what's happening we know what's happening and um and god willing we'll live through it and uh, we'll get to tell our kids and our grandkids and um and we'll be in charge of a lot of the uh, distribution of resources as we should be because we understand reality which is you know very rare and important thing these days. Absolutely, Rafi. That's uh, I think that's a great place to to wrap up. Of course, you do a lot of writing on Seeking Alpha under the name The Endgame Investor, directly for exactly what we, you know, the scenario we just talked about, right? Yeah, that's what I do. I'm trying to I'm trying I'm not trying to convince people to buy gold and silver. I'm trying to guide the people who already know that that's what they have to do. Um uh, to okay, you know, like <laughs> you hear, you feel the boat rocking, so uh, you know, I'll 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 navigate and calm everyone down as much as I can and calm myself down. I'm really trying to calm myself down and use <laughs> words that 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 you know reassure me, and because I'm an emotional being just like anyone else, and 
And uh, so I'm just uh, I'm just trying to anchor people's thoughts and keep keep uh, keep their head on the logic of it that it is inescapable and that if you just let it happen and um, and don't overextend yourself, look, you'll make it to the end of this game, and um, it will be either glorious or terrifying depending on what side of it you're on. Well, Rafi, I appreciate you uh, giving us some uh, some some traction in this in this world where it seems like there's a million different things to spin you off in some direction. Of course, you're you're uh, a, a great follow on Twitter as well at Rafi Farber, and your YouTube channel Rafi Farber. Rafi, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.